All right, guys, we are back again with the Pat's Devin podcast interview series. And today we have Tim Dolan, mindset coach. I've I've become acquainted with Tim, of course, over the great Twitter website. And I've been really loving what what you've been putting out, man. He, it, a lot of a lot of really, you know, you can you can feel the passion behind what you're saying about helping men, helping men become better fathers. Um Tell the audience a little bit about your journey and how you got started into mindset coaching. Sure. Thank you, Pat. Uh, I really appreciate that, man. It means a lot to me coming from you, uh, honestly. And it's just been such a humbling experience starting out in this like Twitter space. Like you said, uh, this all kind of started um, from me just using social media as a tool instead of just like kind of a draining, uh, whatever, infinite scrolling uh, just waste of time, really, you know, uh, or, you know, enjoy your pastimes, but we kind of have to be in control of where we're, our attention is going. And again, I'm, you know, a young guy, I'm 25. And so I just had a lot on my plate for a long time. So I, I wasn't really intentional with my use of, of social media. And so it's definitely uh, changed my life. Um, but yeah, just a little bit of background on how I started this whole thing. Uh, like I said, I was a uh, college athlete. Uh, bounced around a lot. I played football, uh, really formed a lot of my life and my opinions on things and uh, my attitude, my mindset that I do like to bring to the play with my coaching. I think it kind of forged from just my life experience uh, growing up without some things and grow just seeing different things and having that influence where I go and the decisions I make. And then also, you know, as that athlete, you know, you're busy, you got a busy life, you're doing school, you're doing athletics. I, I wasn't thinking about building uh, business or building uh, the person I wanted to be. Uh, something I do kind of get into a little bit is that I always knew the man I wanted to be uh, because just some you know trauma in the childhood and everything. And, and I always knew I wanted to be a great dad. I wanted to give my kids something I didn't have. Right, that was a huge part of my life journey, and uh, just since I was since I was young. And so I always thought like, okay, this is the man I want to be. These are the th the changes I have to make. But I never put urgency on it and emphasis on it. And because I was just kind of like uh, enjoying the the flow, living the life as a college athlete, right? It's it's a fun time. Um, I, I really appreciate the brotherhood and the work ethic, and then just the college life, right? It's 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 tantalizing. And so what happened was after I was done with that, uh, I had started becoming uh, a husband and a father, and I realized like, hey, now it's time to go. <laughs> There's no more time to wait. I need to this man I want to become. I need to get to A to B real quick, you know. Um, and so there's never been a, a bigger uh, fire of urgency in me than when I, I knew I was getting married and, you know, I knew I was going to be a father, all those things. And so, yeah, that's when the real fire lit and like, okay, now I need to start taking action on these things I know I want to become. The man I wanted to be, I wanted to lose weight. I wanted to be a healthy guy uh, and have that leading for my family, right? Lead by example in that way. I wanted to... Uh, quit pornography, stop looking at it all together. Right. And, and some other things in that nature, just, uh, I want to be successful too, like financially independent, Ton, tons of things that I think about, but in college I was just kind of distracted. I was just busy doing my thing. I definitely could have pulled back in areas and started this journey sooner. But for me, it took me getting to that point where it's like, now there's no more, it's go time, baby. We got to go, you know? And so that's where the fire of my journey started. And then I took that over a year, uh, about like a year of, of going through that. And, and again, getting onto Twitter and start seeing other people that have a similar energy, you know, and, and you yourself, you know, with your, with your own coaching, I came across you back in 2016, like back, I think I was like graduating high school at that time. And uh, you just had really like, based like dating so, advice so old right now. Hey man, I'm, I, yeah. <laughs> that's the reality. <laughs> um, but I just know, just honestly, uh, I think uh, you you had like retweeted one, like I commented under one like way back then, and you retweeted it, and I was like, oh, cool, this is a, this is a thing, you know, people do this. Um, and so yeah, it, it's just been cool to uh, get back into social media and and use it to to network with people like this and and find people that are actually helping men and and other other people with different problems in their lives, you know, uh, because I think again, I think a lot of people just kind of meander. And they just let these things kind of fester in them. They don't think there's help or they don't believe in in coaching or whatever else. It, it's just a lot of, you know, not seeking for help. Mm -hmm. And so, so, yeah, I resonated with you and some other people that are just on fire and trying to uh, get the best for themselves. And 
put that out there, that energy. And so it's, it's, it's just changed my life, the examples that are set by other profiles. Um, and I, I guess to just give a little more context to that, uh, it, it means a lot to me specifically because growing up, I didn't have you know, mentors. I didn't have, uh, examples of what a man should be, or like I had different men in my life, but they're all, none of them were like on top of their game, you know, in, in multiple different facets. There was some that were, that were definitely, uh, some good inspirations that I took pieces from, but it was never like not one solid dude, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and my dad specifically like, wasn't there, uh, for a large part of my childhood. And then, uh, it, it was it was just a weird weird play and we can get into get into that it's a big it's a big uh story and everything but it just the message is that like i didn't have that growing up and so seeing people online that are just being genuine they're not trying to grift or anything they're just saying like hey look i'm living this life i'm not just talking i'm not this isn't just an ad you're seeing that's saying like hey make this much money do whatever you want right this is the life i'm living this is the the receipts and this yeah. is how i got here and i think that's powerful i think um you know that genuine that authenticity that comes from that and uh, it just is an inspiration to see all these people that aren't sacrificing anything. They're get, they, they're the fathers they should be. They're uh, successful in business, right? Um, their marriage is on fire, right? And so these things that I never thought could co coesce, I never had an example of a solid unit like that. It was just, ma it made it tangible for me because uh, I have all these dreams and I hear stories of like, oh, people stayed together since high school. They did all this, uh, whatever. And I'm like, that's nice, but it's so unrealistic, right? That's not real. And it's like, no, no, that can happen. Like, you, you know, uh, for me and me and my wife, uh, been together, uh, 10 years now, it will be on May 22nd. And mm -hmm. we were married two at that point. So we, we were those high school sweethearts. We did kind of go through a lot and, uh, make that happen. And so that's our, you know, our passion and we're, uh, yeah. So it's just, it makes it more tangible and more real of a goal. Right. And so again, I, that's what I got from people. And it's also like what I want to give back is that authenticity and that, that, you know. Yeah. So I'm curious, cause I think this is going to resonate with a lot of guys. I mean, you were, you were kind of alluding to some various, you know, it's sounded, you could say mindset issues, right. But self-sabotage, not really being on point, not really being on your game. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, your father and what, sort of what occurred there and how maybe his absence, how, how you feel like it maybe affected you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so it, you ever have a hero, Pat, you have yeah. a hero, yeah. right? And so I think a lot of people will resonate with like your dad should be your hero. Right. And so my parents divorced before I could remember. Um, and I always grew up thinking it was normal that like I only saw my dad like once every other month for like a weekend. Right. And we always did something fun. We did something like awesome. We went to the uh, movies, uh, to a park or something. I don't know. Um, and so, or I just hang out with him at home at his, at his place and we'd watch a movie or something. And so, uh, it was always great to, like, as a kid, it was just a positive experience. And my mom never talked, about, I'm sorry. That's, that's my, that's my dog. Probably hear him in the background. Um, but so you never, uh, my mom was really good about never talking, talking down about him. And so she made him out to be this kind of heroic guy. You know, he's a ex Marine and he's a police officer. And so, or he was at the time, you know, a sheriff. And so I was like, Oh, he's the good guy. And, uh, he, again, um, you know, loves me and that all the, all this other stuff. I just don't see him all the time. I, th I just thought that was normal. And so I grew up idolizing him. Um, I grew up wanting to be with him as much as I could. Uh, I remember, you talk about like the pain of, of not having him around. I remember specific moments like in my childhood where it was just really tough and I was just crying and I was just like, I want, I wanted him there. Like, why isn't he there? You know? And so that emotional uh, damage, it definitely sucks to go through. Um, but my mom told me that there would be times when I was like sitting on the couch, like looking out the window, like waiting like all day for him to come and he, he wouldn't show up. And so it's like that. But was he supposed to show up that day? Yeah. Yeah. No, he, yeah. he had said like, Hey, you know, this is the day or whatever we're going to pick up. And so I'd get all excited to get my backpack ready. I'm ready. And then it's just waiting there and doesn't show up. Mm -hmm. And so that happened a couple of times. And uh, so, yeah, it's, it was definitely hurtful, but I, again, I thought it was normal, right? I had no other reference and I thought just everyone kind of went through this and I, I through middle school, I kind of started going to friends' houses more and stuff. And I see like a, you know, 
solid unit together and it's 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 not crazy or anything um but i'm just like oh there's a different way like not everyone you know does it this way um so basically yeah like i said it, it hurt but i i grew up thinking he was my hero i grew up idolizing him and wanting to earn his affection and i actually so i'm a huge nerd i don't know it's, it's just i'm gonna i'm just say it you know i love superheroes comics movies all sorts of stuff video games um and I never was a big football guy. I never was a big sports guy. A lot of guys you talk to, they're like, oh, I wanted to be in the NFL since I was a kid. It's like, that wasn't me. Uh, uh, but I saw my dad whenever I was with him. He's always playing the game. He's oh. always got his big speaker out. And he's like loudly yelling at them as if they can hear him and clapping. And, you know, so it was a big event. So I'm like, oh, my dad loves football so much. And so in fifth grade, I actually, uh, I wanted to play football. And so that's what kind of started my, my want to get into it. And I think it was because I thought like, hey, if I play football, he'll be around more. He'll want to be here more. He'll love me more, whatever else. Right. And so uh, and it worked like he started coming to games. You know, I, I saw him more. It was cool. It definitely helped. Um, and I was like a little chubby kid. So the exercise was good, too. Um, but there was that time when I was like raised by my mom and there wasn't really a masculine presence in the home. And so I had suffered for it. You know, I was uh, kind of a chubby kid. I you know, I didn't have a great diet. I, I'd play outside a lot, but I still like, it just, it gets out of hand. Right. And so I would have days where I'd like play video games a lot too, but I was always an imaginative kid. I always played outside a lot, but so that had its effect. And, and what happened in, in middle school by like eighth grade, uh, I got a message, like a letter from him. Cause we, ended up on, we went on a retreat or something. And so I got a letter from him that said, it's time to become a man. You're going to come live with me now. And we're going to, you know, whatever. And so I was excited. I was like, oh, wow, this is crazy. Um, it's just, just crazy moments. You know, you're, you're becoming a man and like those angsty preteen years, you know. So this so was when you were in middle school or high school? Middle school, eighth grade, eighth grade retreat. I was going to go to high school. Um, and so I was all jazzed up about it. I was like, let's go. Like, uh, let, let's do it. This is Dolan family. Let's go. Um, and, but my mom, uh, she, she was very uh, cautious, but ultimately she let it ha like, because she, you know, protective over me and she was always scolding him when he wouldn't, you know, when he wouldn't show up and stuff like that. Um, but she, she let it happen and she let me go. It was hard for her, but she did it because she didn't know her dad yeah. like at all. And all she wanted was for me, you know, any type of relationship would be better than nothing, which I'll still submit. Like, I'm not here to talk trash on my dad. I'm not here to make it a sad story or nothing. A lot of people go through this. A lot of people go through much worse. I'm not blinded and saying, like, oh, woe is me. I've had, you know, that's not the case. Um, but what happened was I ended up going with him and I'm all excited. And every year through high school, progressively, it was the process of me seeing my hero and my idol just deteriorate, just hmm. become very human and then become worse you know someone that i shouldn't look to to idolize and someone i should learn from in fact mm -hmm. you know so that kind of culminated towards like junior to senior year and it really like had a huge impact on me um but again so like i said i'm not going to talk all bad about him what i can say for the man absolutely is that no matter all the crap we go through or whatever he taught me to be a leader Mm -hmm. Like one thing that every, like he did impose on me every practice that he would drive me to for football. And, and so this was a big part of our relationship. Football is like, that was huge to us. That's really our, our, what we had to, you know, he was a football player and in high school. Um, and so, and he actually paid for me to get extra, you know, training and stuff, which I didn't appreciate at the time. Cause I'm just lazy. I was like, why do I got to do this twice? <laughs> I did this at school, but, um, but no, so he invested. And so the things I can say for him is that he was always like, investing in my future financially he paid me to go to a good private catholic school we had good competition and um and again paid for training right and so i mean i was a big kid so it's like makes sense but um but yes yeah, so, like i said he every day he dropped me off at practice he'd say go be a leader out there don't be afraid to be a leader step up be the one to say something be a leader and it's just ingrained in me you know day after day after day and i was like a charismatic guy i had friends and stuff i'm not the most charismatic you know, there's definitely in a big enough group, probably someone better or whatever. But um, if I didn't have that push to like be a leader, especially in the competitive environment, you know, I really don't think I would have had this reverence for leadership in my role and, and that men's role. You know, I, I make some tweets sometimes talking about leadership and everyone is a leader. You can't get away from it. If you're leading nothing else, you're leading yourself. Right. You have to lead yourself effectively. And you, if you don't do that, you're not going to be able to lead anybody else. 
And so we got to take that role seriously, not be afraid of it, but like embrace it. Right. And so a huge part of me is leadership. And I have to give that to him. There's no way it wasn't, it didn't come from him ingraining it into me because like I said, the way I grew up, um, you know, love my mom and everything, but it was a little coddling, you know, and I was mama's boy and it wasn't very edge, you know, it was kind of soft a little bit. Um, so I, I have to thank like football and everything it did for me being in that masculine environment, that team energy, um, that locker room talk and the, the mentors, we had really good coaches, you know, that cared about us. And, and I saw all of them as father figures, you know, that's just natural how it goes. And um, so I can't describe, you know, the, uh, the benefit that did for me in my life, especially at a time when my big father figure was like crumbling, you know, I had other ones to just get from uh, and, and see the difference. Uh, well, no, I mean, I, you don't have to go too much into detail if you don't feel comfortable with it. No, but, dude, I, but, I open book. I love talking. So how, how exactly was he crumbling? Because, I mean, obviously yeah. any man, you know, like I could say this as like a Twitter personality, you know, people put sure. all sorts of stuff on, on to me, you know, yeah. see my my fire tweets and they think like, oh, my God. But, you know, I'm a human being. He's like, deranged. I, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's right. It's like I'm either I'm either the hero or the villain, you know, depending yeah, on, yeah. on who you who you ask. <laughs> um, but it's, you know, the reality is I'm, I'm just a, a human being. And I've and I've had that same sort of thing on the receiving end with other, you know, online personalities and, and big people and, you know, you meet them in person and you first, you know, you have this sort of starstruck thing, but if you actually spend a lot more time with them, you're like, Oh no, that's a cool guy. But it's like, yeah, no. And I'm not here to <laughs> condemn the man, you know, um, I'm sure you can grab a beer with him and you'll hit, you know, whatever. But um, yeah, so it, it was, so he's just, you know, he has a, a problem with, with lust and he has a problem with, uh, he just can't, you know, control that side of him. And he's been honest with me um, over drinks uh, mm -hmm. that, you know, it's, it's his, his big vice. Um, and he had some trouble in his past where he was, uh, he was exposed to stuff sooner than he should have been sure. um, taken advantage of sooner than he should have been. Not that he would have objected, but you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. um, and so that impacted his view on it. And, and this is really gets to a deeper root problem that affects a lot of people as far as like, you know, lust and pornography and, and other things like that and just sexual nature uh, and what that's doing to the culture we find ourselves in combined with the fatherhood stuff part that I'm huge on. But anyway, uh, so that really affected him. It was his, his demon in life. And so he's never been able to hold a solid relationship despite him trying. And so like with, with my mom and he was a military guy too. So he was traveling a lot, you know? Um, but so that was his big thing with, with that. And he, so he didn't work with my mom. And then what actually happened, you know, my, my stepmom I says, and uh, he had, I have a little brother and sister, you know, with them. Mm -hmm. And so, I came in, you know, and I didn't know any of that. I, I, he was my hero. He was just a good guy. He, and he had, and he has, you know, decently good things. He teaches me to be respectful and stuff generally. So generally old timey, good advice. Right. Um, it's just, when you get to the deeper stuff, it's like, he's clearly doesn't have it all there. And so, uh, yeah, it was just me learning. He, he also is an alcoholic. Right. And so he, he drinks a lot too, and would, uh, like drive me around sometimes, uh, a couple of times where it's just, you know, wasn't, he wasn't all there, I'll say, you know, and so those times were kind of scary, even as a high schooler. But uh, and um, it was just kind of frustrating. Like you knew when he was in that when he was inebriated and it was like it changed the whole environment and you had to just just live like like, you know, you know what I'm saying? Like walk on eggshells, yeah. make sure things yeah. don't get into a confrontation. Um, so what happened was the first year I moved, I moved in with him in, in freshman year. It was just me and him in an apartment. Right. And so I was living off of hungry man, frozen meals and frozen pizzas. Like he went to work at night and I, he picked me up and I, you know, was basically left to my own devices. Um, and, uh, and so that just, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't a great environment, but then what happened was we moved in, he reconciled with my stepmom and the two kids, right. Cause they were a part of the time because of this infidelity. So, and then yeah. what, so I sophomore and junior year, I got something that I, I never had which was like a dad and a mom in the home and two kids. And I was an older brother, you know, mm -hmm. I had a brother and sister that I grew up with. They're great. Uh, we picked on each other, all that stuff. But um, I was actually the older brother this time. And it was like a, a family unit, you know, um, not perfect, but it was really nice. And I, I didn't know what I had. I didn't appreciate what I had until it left mm -hmm. because in 
junior year, end of junior year, and start of senior year, it was crumbling again. Um, like I said before, my parents divorced before I knew anything. So all I got was like, this is just how it is. You know, I know he loves me and he's just not here. That's normal. Mm -hmm. But I got what it was supposed to be like. And again, going to more people's houses and seeing how their families, you know, um, so I kind of got a sense of what it should be. And then I saw it like in front of my face as like a 17 year old kid, knowing a lot more about things. Uh, it happened again, right? Uh, family splitting up, uh, infidelity, um and his kind of he doesn't handle stuff well either you know he's not like he he doesn't handle conflict super well he's like a cop so he's just aggressive with it and not not he doesn't hurt anybody you know but um it's just it's hard to get to him get through to him talk to him like that and that's something i've always feel like i kind of had a skill for as far as communication like conflict resolution and and keeping a cool head and getting others to like saying the right thing at the right time um but yeah so he just He's not on that. And so it was just really tough for me um, to have that and then to have it taken away. And I was just really resentful and spiteful at him for a long time. Um, And I actually, you know, me and Julie, my wife, she, we talked about this later on, but like I said, we were together in high school and I was always a big, I just want to find the right girl and stay with her. You Mm -hmm. know, I didn't have really many girlfriends before that. Um, And so there was a point like, we were together like two and a half years. And so she's just great. She's just super uh, awesome. And she, she was like, Oh, we should get married sometime. Um, I think just that, that concept. So she, she mentioned that like casually, right. I think she texted me and this is while I'm seeing this family unit crumble and the whole of like, I'm going to become my father. I have so much, like, I can't, you know, just fear cowardice. I I don't have any base and I see these things I want to be, but I, I don't, have any structure for it. So out of my fear, I I ghosted her. I didn't talk to her. And then the next day, you know, brought it up and she asked what's up. And I said, I just can't, I can't think about a marriage, right? First of all, it's high school. So it's not really, you know, a great place to talk about it anyway, but I couldn't fathom that. I was just going through pain. I'm like, I, I can't think about that right now. I still love you. I still want to whatever, but I don't want, I can't think of a long-term thing right now. And so I found out later because we went, like after high school, I went away for college for sports. And so we kept together long distance, like a year and a half. It was tough, but we did it. Um, but yeah, so we had trials throughout college and we didn't get married until later. And I always wish I had married her sooner, but I talked to her and she found out like she, after that moment in high school, she stopped bringing, like she stopped bringing up marriage at all. Like she just put it away and she was like, okay, we're just going to be here as long as we can. Uh, I'm going to love him, be here for him. But now I know it's not as on the table as it was before. You know, so she had a purity of like, no, we're just life together. That's what's going to happen. And I, she dropped that because of my fear in that moment when she came at me with that. And I said, I can't talk about that right now. And so that led us to, you know, not, uh, took me a while to figure out, yeah, hey, you want this, you know, you want this, get married, do the things, you know. Um, But so, yeah, that it it was just, that was just a little side note. Um, Mm-hmm. But if that if that answers your question, it, that's what was really hard is, is his infidelity, the alcoholism, um, and just he, he's. Uh, but I've learned a lot about being a good father um, this past year, and you know it's it's just he didn't have the intent. Like he would, I think I played catch with him like twice. He was very performative, right? So he'll do some things sometimes. He just never. He's just kind of selfish, and he never made time for what he said was important to him. You know, so he always took it for granted that type of thing. Um, I think that's a pretty good summary of it. Yeah. And I appreciate you sharing that. You know, it's, that was very real and raw. And I think a lot of guys are going to resonate with, with it. Um, I hope so. That's, that's what I've found. Um, being, being able to share a story like that is there's a lot of people that connect with it more than it it sucks. How actual familiar it is. Yeah. It does. And, And even when, you know, parents aren't divorced, father's kind of in the picture. I I think one of the really difficult things for a lot of guys, and it's actually part of the process of becoming a man yourself, is realizing that your father is just a human being. Yeah. Um, In that he had, that he had flaws, he had issues. Even if he's a great father, you know, you can, obviously you can look up to him and admire him, but he's going to have some degree of flaw with him and and you have to you have it's actually part of seeing him as a human that takes some of this pressure off of him because you know a lot of fathers i'm sure your father feels the same way 
you know, they know when they're falling short and there's a, they feel guilt about it. Now they might express that in different ways. They might try to run away from the whole situation because they feel like they're not up for the task or they're not good enough. I mean, that's, I think that's the reason a lot of fathers disappear from the picture. Because yeah. Like, well, what, what good am I anyway? You know, I'm, I might yeah. as well get out of there. And what happens is that when you forgive your father and when you understand he was a human, he did the best he could based on his own circumstances. Even if it was a shade job, he did the best he could. You know, these guys had their own experiences that informed yeah. their own behavior. That that just it takes it takes the pressure off of him and helps him to actually to heal. And you kind of become a father to your own father in yep. a certain sense, or at least, at least an equal at least an equal man and yeah and that's when you grow up because you know you have guys who are like well my dad didn't do this my dad didn't do that it's like yeah he didn't yeah and, like high five what are you gonna do about it <laughs> yeah you know like you can the part of the part of you that is still holding a grudge about that is a child is the child part of yourself yeah and you're letting the child dominate your interactions with the world yeah um, so no that's that's profound um and it actually took me uh i think i was definitely bitter for a while i don't think i ever hated him but it was like a year or so of just like and it was it was weird it was an awkward time because i still needed guidance i was getting recruited to go to college and i i you know for football stuff and so that was still a, something that kept us together even though i was pissed at him for other things right um but i was never like not a grateful kid uh like I, I recognized, you know, the opportunity I had and I recognized, I appreciated it for it. We had actually a fight like junior year or something where we were kind of yelling at each other, but um, he, and so it made it clear where he thinks his priorities are and, and where his drive is as life. Cause he, he was basically yelling at me. I forget how it started, but what the big moment was like, he yelled, everything I've done in my life has been for you, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think that like, I resonate with it. Like, yeah, I, I, that providing fatherly, like it's just in us, it's in our DNA. Um, so I definitely see how he thinks that. And I was just like in tears. I was just like, I just wanted, I, I don't care about all of this, you know, I, but I just wanted you there, you know, yeah, yeah. like, cause none, none of that matters if the relationship isn't there, you know, if, if it's not, um, if I'm not getting what I need on the other end and you get that a lot. Uh, I'm going to talk about Zach small a little bit. I don't know if you, if you you know who he is, but I've gotten a lot as far as fathership, fatherhood advice from him and, and um, what they were, they were, he was running like a dad's day space for a while that I was really blessed to like hop into and, and gain a lot of information from. Um, but so he says, you know, it's not about the presence that you buy them, but your presence as a father. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that's just rang true completely um, because you can get them all the toys, you can get them all the opportunity and that's good. You should move your generational family line forward. That's your job. But that's ticket to entry, man. That's ticket to entry fatherhood. Like, congrats. You had a kid. Your job is to do that. I'm not going to pat you on the back for it. What else are you going to do to make sure that this kid makes the most of that opportunity? Right? You you hand, I mean, stupid example, but you hand a monkey a shotgun. Like, what Like what do you want them? They're not going to aim it or nothing. You know? Like, uh, you have to guide them and be a relationship force for them so that they know they'll – so many people are afraid of everything. They're afraid to try things. They, they have no confidence, right? And they, they, they'll they have that fear hold them back from living out their lives the way they want to. And so when you're trapped by that fear, you're playing, you're going the safe route and you're going to end up in like a loveless marriage or in a cubicle for 30 years with a company that doesn't want to, anything to do with you. They'll drop you off the sign of a hat, right? Whatever. Mm -hmm. um, you're not getting the most out of life because you're, you're just, I don't, I'm not worth it, Right. Um, that stems from the father not not instilling that that guidance in you and knowing that hey I'm here for you no matter what right unconditional love that's it's it's here um, I'm not gonna rebuke you or nothing um, but you know so go out and try your things and I'll always be here to catch you but you know again that guidance and that nurturing of like this is how we do what we do with these resources right um, that part is huge and it's it's kind of just missed a lot nowadays uh, but you were talking about um you know forgiving your father and that's the, you know i had to hear it from another friend who kind of went through something similar uh about yeah i i had a talk with him and i forgave him and it just and it it 
it may, helped me learn because I was always like, I'll forgive him someday. I wasn't like resentful. I didn't hate him. You know, I just didn't want to deal with it. I was doing college. I was doing everything else. Another task on my list when I want to be a man, I'll do this. Right. But never put any urgency to it. Right. And so uh, I had a conversation with a friend and he said he had that talk and it just it was freeing. It it, it changed my view of forgiveness from something that I'm giving to him to something that is for me. Right. Mm-hmm. It's not. It's not supposed to be you're you're making what they did to you okay. It's not opening yourself up to get hurt again. It is literally giving yourself peace of mind to move forward in your life. You know, not letting them live rent free in your head anymore. It's breaking that chain. You know, um, and that's that's the freedom from from your trauma from your abuse. It's being able to, like, it doesn't ha- like it might hurt to say I forgive them because of everything and all the past, but it's it's not about them. It's about your healing and and, and letting go. And then, you know, absolutely establishing boundaries, you know, whatever it may be. But um, I what I like to say is like because everyone's got baggage, everyone's got trauma, everyone's got pain. And uh, the way to like make the most of it to move on is to, you know, I think some signs are uh, a person forgiven, you know, uh, a lesson learned and a story shared. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, because I think the pain is kind of useless, but the, the, the problem is people will bury it. They don't address it. Like I was, I was burying it. Right. But when we do that and we just ignore it, we're setting up a landmine for later in our lives. And now that pain is liable to bleed out onto other people, not just yourself. And then what now you're, you're there's more than you in the blast radius now. And it's your fault now because you've taken that pain and, and caused more, you know? So if we really want to be intentional and be on top of our stuff and, and forget and, and get past it, we have to address it. And again, you know, forgiveness is a whole nother thing, but a lesson learned and a story shared. I think when you can share the story, this is especially true with fatherhood. We're supposed to be teaching our kids lessons. One of the biggest things is, is being able to teach your kids the lessons you learned throughout life without the pain, right? Cause life will teach you period. Like you can let them off to the world and, and they'll come out something, you know, at the end of after they mature and everything, they'll learn their lessons and they'll come out some way with some type of worldview with it. And, and they'll learn the lessons they do. But as a parent, again, and moving the generational line forward, you want to teach them those lessons without the pain, you know, otherwise, what, why did you go through the pain? If you can't help others manage it and, and, you know, not have it as harsh as you did, do you want others to feel that's like, so, there needs to be that reconciliation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think that forgiveness in general, like a lot of people misunderstand it. Um, you know, it's, and, and I kind of get it because people misunderstand it in both directions. I mean, you have, you have some people who just say, you know, you're supposed to forgive, especially Christians. And there's so much. Yeah. Yeah. A huge part to get into with that. Yeah. This is like some, like somebody's a total, you know, piece of shit. And just like, just turn the other cheek, you know, you have to forgive them. It's like, no, no, this is, this is what, what they're telling you to do in this situation is to be a doormat and allow somebody to take advantage of you and abuse you because you're, you know, you're supposed to. And I, I I think this is like probably the worst distorted distortion in Christianity today, which it's weakness. It stems from the weakness of Christians. Yeah. Whereas you know, you forgive real forgiveness has nothing to do with justification of right or wrong that the individual has done. What it is, is refusing to be karmically tied to it anymore. Mm. You, you forgive for yourself. You don't forgive for the other person. The other person might get some downstream benefit of it, but it, this isn't like, like when someone says, you know, forgive me, forgive me, you know, that can that can be nice and it might help inform your decision. But you're fundamentally you make that choice just because you don't want to be connected to that. You don't want to allow yourself to be defined by what you received anymore. Um, yeah. And you know, and that's why I think it's forgive, but don't forget. Like, I, I don't think that you should ever forget what people, what people did and who people are. You have to know exactly mm-hmm. who people are and you have to be, you know, smart enough not to put yourself in a situation where, you know, someone takes advantage of you. Okay. Forgive them. But like, don't that get, 
taken advantage of again. Well, that's the lesson learned part, right? And that's yeah. huge. If you don't learn the lesson, then you're just going to keep. So there's, I think there's two ways you become a doormat. If you don't learn the lesson, you're just going to keep getting hurt. But also you talk about weakness and Christians. Forgiveness needs to be what we're talking about. It can't, if you're using forgiveness as conflict resolution, because it's the easiest path out. And like, I don't have to confront this because I'll, Oh, I forgive you. It's okay. We don't have to have an awkward or hurtful conversation. I don't have to feel these feelings. I just forgive you and I'll try to avoid you, but I'll still be here. and willing to get hurt. You know, that's, that's just cowardice is what yeah. that is. You're not dealing with your feelings. You're avoiding the problem. You're burying it. It's going to build up resentment and it's going to blow up yeah. um, on you and others. So, and, and I think that even so comes from a place of lack of self-worth and and again, lack of of confidence and, and love for yourself to to know what's best and, and put in the effort it takes to get it right for for you because a lot of like if you're if you're trying to not get hurt by this person and you're so worried about the relationship or whatever history or whatever factor and you're willing to get hurt more you're abusing yourself you you don't understand like you're not taking care of yourself. And you're just letting your so so and that lack of self-worth stems from the broken home. It stems from not instilling those values, you know, when you're when you're young and and, and I think you know this is this underlies confusion about even martyrdom. You know, mm. I, I think there's there's this impulse in Christian circles that like the more you're abused, the better a person you are. But the or maybe reality, your testimony's better. Yeah, yeah. It's like you know, you're you're a better you're a better Christian the more you you take it. But it's a fundamental misunderstanding. It's like it's a, it's the wrong intention. You know, Jesus died for our sins. Yeah. And there was there was a very strong. He was doing it for a specific purpose. He wasn't doing it because he felt like you know, I deserve to receive this. No, he, dude was sweating bullets in the yeah. garden of Gethsemane, like sweating uh, blood, like, please pass this cup for me. If it can be passed, you it know, was a matter of integrity to show people themselves. It wasn't a sense of like, I'm a better person by allowing myself to be abused, had yeah. nothing to do with that. And, and this is why, like, this is, I mean, we're, we're on a total digression, but I think it's really interesting why, you know, the whole arguments about religion and people talking about religion to me is generally so pointless because it's so easy for two people to talk past each other. You have a lot of religious people who interpret, who, who, who engage with material at a completely different level of consciousness and resonance. Yeah. And so if you know, you're an atheist, for instance, you can easily say like, this is retarded and it would be retarded. <laughs> You know, it's it's it really like there's so much subtleties in, in how you understand this and how you engage with it. Yeah. Um, you know, being a martyr can be a very powerful thing, but you, you have to have the right intention. If your intention is everything is about intention. If your intention yeah. is off with an act, you know, you can be generous to people. But if your intention is to be known as the most generous person, then you're not you're reducing so much of, of that benefit because it's it's selfish in the yeah end. yeah absolutely and and at the, you'll, you'll try to hide it too you know because you know the outcome you want and you know maybe portraying your true intentions aren't the best way to get that outcome but it'll come out you know yeah. the whatever roots of intention you have will be evident in your the fruit of whatever you do right but i think you made a good point about about christians and and i think something about true strength you know comes from restraint Mm -hmm. Right. And so you talk about Jesus and what he did. There's I forget which gospel it's in. There's a part where he talks. I think it's when Peter cuts off the ear of some dude. But he talks about like, could I not uh, sheath your blade? Like, could I not summon like seven legions of angels right now if I wanted to? You mm -hmm. know, and so it's like he is it, it is that strength, the, the restraint of strength. He has the ultimate power to do this, but he's submitting to the will of the father. And and again, for the benefit of us who are, are guilty sinners. Right. So it's like, well, yeah, it's crazy. And, and it was also a matter of, of truth. Like yeah. he's, he's putting out the truth and he's allowing himself to get persecuted for it. And, you know, it, it's, it's not this sort of like, I'm, I'm good because I let other people 
be mean to me. It, yeah. It's that I'm standing up for the truth and evil people are going to come after me as a result. And I'm willing to suffer as a result of that because the truth is more important than my own personal suffering. That is, the, that is the ultimate and, and the whole metaphysics behind it that is that then by being persecuted for the truth, it forces people to come to terms with their own distortions because yeah. now what they're doing is they're not really engaging against like – a man or a pro, you know projection what they are engaging against is is wait a minute i'm a bad person that and and that's and that was the whole profoundness of it is that people yeah. suddenly were like oh my god i'm a bad person because i killed the most innocent thing that could possibly exist and yeah it, and it's changed the consciousness it created this it's, and, and any other, you know, saint or martyr in the future who operated with the same kind of intention, then they were doing that. It wasn't, it's not like, you know, ma neighbors mean to me all the time, but I continue to, you know, make them dinner because that's what Jesus would do. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, man. You know. No. Uh, <laughs> no, that's, that's part that's, of the feminization of society. And it's, it's, you know, it's. it's taken root in the church, you know, uh, that, that softness, that, that weakness, um, that niceness, right. Yeah. I have to be nice as a, as a Christian. No, the nice thing to do, the loving thing to do, true love is not lying to someone and, and letting, uh, mental illness take root or, or whatever else, you know, abuse, um, uh, continue to happen, right. It is speaking the truth boldly and calling them out. And I love, uh, I, that I got from being a leader in football, in the football locker room, that competitive environment, you know, yeah it allowed me, it forged my ability to call people out and to, but you got to do it. Like, again, people say, Oh, judge not lest you be judged. No, Jesus is telling us to judge righteously, yeah. right? That plank in your, don't, don't take out the speck in someone else's eye unless it's because there's a plank or log in yours, right? It doesn't mean don't judge. It means judge righteously. So we are to lead by example and we are to, you know, not be not as long we're going to be hypocrites. We're sinners. That's what the church is, right? So don't think that Christians are perfect. That's not the message I'm trying to say here. But it is our duty as we are discipled and as we grow in our faith to be sanctified and be more like Jesus Christ and to, again, you know, call out. Uh, it's not about being nice. It's not about being a doormat. It's about standing up to evil and and actually, you know, living the truth and, and leading by example in that regard, right? So you talk about a warrior, uh, like God will build up his warriors and to, to have the spiritual war with, with the culture and everything. But that comes from a place of, of humility. You know, it comes from a place it's again, you're talking about intention. It can't be from the wrong, wrong intention, right? Cause that will, again, just sow seeds of discord and, and, and not really honor the kingdom. So when you're talking about what, why to do something, you know, it should be to, to glorify God, to push the kingdom forward. And, strength is needed it's not like niceness or weakness being a doormat but it's needed to combat because there's real evil out there and what's crazy about some atheists or other people I've, I've interacted with is that they'll acknowledge the evil or they'll acknowledge that there's real like demonic or whatever power going on but they they don't see the inverse you know they don't like it cannot happen without without the good you know um so yeah that's there's a bunch to get into there about uh, theological uh yeah but let's let's, let's 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 turn it back i mean i you know sure. i with with guys, we were, we were talking about this a bit earlier um, off off the show, but it's hard to talk about forgiveness without getting to Jesus. So that's kind of where we were, and then we came to this. And well, where where I wanted to take this was, I mean, so you know, as a man, like men are really looking for a mission, right? Yeah. And I think this is so it's so connected to. Like I wrote about this recently on my email list, and I, I've been. You know, there's so many different things you can talk about that men have as problems with women. And, you know, there's so many things you can talk about that men have as, you know, not really being men. But I, yeah. I think that there's like the, the closer you can get to the core of stuff, the better. And I also, you know, I'm very much aligned with Jack Donovan's kind of distinction between the difference between being a good man and being a man that there's mm -hmm. there's a difference between these two things and i and i think it is important that we that we distinguish that um yeah i what i don't what i don't see men having today is vitality i i, I see a really demoralized sapped black populated. pill black pilled. Yeah. yeah I, I don't see anybody who, 
who who actually I don't want to say anybody, but you know, you know what I'm trying to say here. There there are so few men who are willing to embrace that fire and and put themselves in you know potentially hazardous situations it doesn't have to even be like physically i'm not even trying to tell people to be like you know reckless and suicidal but it's just that there is a certain recklessness to masculine energy i mean masculine energy yeah. is on the frontier there's nothing like i just i i it pisses me off when i hear people talk about like you know that does that was that was a bad decision or you know there needs to be more you know you're not there's oh, a lot hindsight, of like people. Monday morning quarterbacks or whatever. Well, there's a lot of that, yeah, for yeah. sure. And I think Monday morning quarterbacking is 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 something that can only come from guys who just themselves aren't in the arena. Because if you've yep. ever been in the yep. arena yourself, and you see a guy who makes a mistake and you know gets crushed, you you know you honor him to a certain extent. You're like you like you know that's chalk it up to the game it's part of the experience of being a man yeah but but you know you're still going to raise a glass to him because he went out he went out swinging he went out you know he did he did what he could do right he had the balls to do something the balls to do which something. is more than a lot can say nowadays right it's so easy to be critical and so easy to point out, oh this is bad this is bad this is bad what are you doing in your life brother where are your priorities where are your focuses like i'm going to i'm going to be honest i'm i'm really I'm, I'm disgusted by them. I actually like, I look at, I look at them and they are really physically revolting to me. Yeah. Yeah. This, this gets to a huge point too, that I've kind of like, as a coach, when you start trying, like, I'm going to help people, whatever. Right. Um, maybe you have the good intentions, but it's like, you, you see some of the depravity and you see some of the, uh, just how much farther away they are from where you're at. And it's, it's hard because it is repulsive. Right. So if I see uh, someone in a church or someone in just my community and it's a dad, it's just uh, clearly just not doing the best as a father, whatever the example would be. If it's clear to tell someone's just not getting the most out of life, it's it's just it is a re- like what, what like a disgust. Like, how are you not on this mission? How do you are do you not? Because because here's the thing that boils down, at least for me, it's like it comes from my love for my kids, my family, my love for God. Like, I want to do my best for these reasons. Right. And so when I see someone. I, I assume is not doing their best and it's important to, you know, give grace until we have information. But it's like when I see someone blatantly uh, not doing their best or causing harm, it's like, like I want to physically check them into the, like what, what is happening right now? Like football side comes out of me, like where, where are you at? Like, why are we not moving forward in this direction? Right. And so it's hard to, because yeah, it is a repulsion. It is a disgust. It is a, like I, I, I physically recoil um, at some of the depravity you would see, but there needs to be, you need to have that love to love of the neighbor to want to make a connection and to want to try. Right. Obviously you can't, uh, you can lead a horse to water. You can't make it drink. That's just going to be the reality with a lot of it. And that's hard to accept as someone with like a savior complex or whatever. But um, you never need to lose your spirit of like, I'm still going to do what I do to try and inspire the best out of, out of these people. Right. Um, because a, a lot of it is, you know, and Ajax said this a lot and it resonated with me, like no one's coming to save you. Right. Yeah. And sure, sure. That's, I think, and, and it's just a masculine energy. There is, there's credence to um, self-sufficiency and pushing that message of you need to like, you need to be okay with the fact that no one's coming to save you. It's great if you have a support system, it's encouraged even, you should build one eventually. But base level, if you have nothing else, you need to be able to back against the wall and fight, you know, not lay down and die. Yeah, and and what I'd add to that, because I 100% agree with Alexander's quote, but I add that, you know, nobody's coming to save you, but they are coming to help you. Yeah, but and being open to that help, yeah. being humble enough to be open to it. Like if you if you if you put yourself out there, you'll suddenly start to find that there are people willing to assist you in that. Um, and I you know I I look at this so much from like the culture at at large, and it's it's really interesting how they gradually broke men. I mean, you got to hand it to them; they're very very good at what they what they do. If you get big picture, and I know you like to get conspiratorial, so I'm excited for where this is going. But um, yeah, that big picture stuff is is sickening. Uh, yeah, all the time. And you know, it's interesting, even just the subtle stuff. I mean, my my father watches a lot of like really old TV shows, like from his childhood. You know. Yeah. 
um, a lot of back in that those days in like the 50s and 60s, it was Westerns. My um, uncle loves Westerns. Uh, yeah. I... Yeah. And, you know, th they're they're heroes like these guys, these in individuals, they're heroes. They're out doing the right thing. You know, they're also humanized to an extent, but they but they sort of embody the you know they're accessible right any the, the th and what i mean by this is that any man could look at this person and say i could be like him yeah you know there there's a human element to him even if he is an ideal whereas today like there has been there's been no sense of superheroes anymore we really i, I mean and what i just to clarify with that like yeah you have marvel yeah. But Marvel's dog shit. Okay, sorry if I pissed anybody <laughs> off with this. It's 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 really dog shit, especially in its current incarnation. I, it's, I'm disgusted with where it was. Yeah, it's it, right now. well, it's look. It's I'm sorry. Like if you enjoy it, fair enough. Whatever you know, you're yeah. welcome, welcome to your guilty pleasure. But it's low IQ. It's a yeah. low IQ storyline. You know, everything is just explosions and constant action. There's very very little human development, and you know, people are gonna you know nitpick and talk about well, this thing. I don't give a fuck about it. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. You, it is not any sort of true classical thing that that you can tell it by its fruits because i don't know a single kid who's like i'm going to be like who, who you see improving their behavior as a result of because watching. of it yeah yeah you don't you don't see it, it, and it and it makes the superheroes like they're not and actually i think this is kind of the distinction they're not heroes they are superheroes and so what they are is they are not achievable by any mm. sort of individual they have some sort of special power they're so far removed that you know you are a spectator you yourself are helpless you can't do anything you can't yeah. possibly Ra rather than it's not like you know what would bronco lane do you know what i mean like i could yeah. be like him i could i could go out and i could help police my neighborhood and i could be you know there's there's yeah. a very difference here and we used to have all these sort of figures in western history we used to have you know you you would have you'd have various knights various historical figures sometimes mythological figures but still humanized still anchored enough like beowulf yeah. somebody yeah. yeah you know what i mean and and the the newest generation frankly even our generation does not even like know know a lot of these stories that is yeah yeah, it's it's like this cultural rot is so extreme and you realize it. Like young boys, they need to be reading stories of heroes. Yeah, 100%. And it gets back to, you know, I, I all this, it's our version of the Greek mythological heroes, right? It's our version of that, what we're at right now. And what's cool about, like, I'm a huge nerd, so I get into some of the superhero stuff. But what's cool about that is, like, a lot of them, the OGs were written back then, right? So the mm -hmm. core uh, character, if you go, like, comic history and different things, storylines, there is value to be taken from that. I definitely think the current cinematic in incarnations are just uh, results of the... I'm not going to say I didn't enjoy them. There's definitely some that I liked. But it's like... Uh, it's a result of, of where the, the culture is right now, right? It's it's a mass-produced, cookie-cutter product, you know, buy the thing, shut up about it. Um, yeah. But again, no, boys do need that that those those heroes, right? And it, especially, it should be the dad, right? But also, we went from, like you were saying, the heroes in the Westerns, and now, like, I grew up on, on Simpsons. Like, it was Homer Simpson, right? And so I I saw a, a dad who loved the family, right? And seemed like he was doing his best. But when you look at objectively... Um, you know, he, he's overweight. He constantly like misses practices or, or whatever. Like he doesn't. So it's, it's again, an ideal of like, cause th there's an emotional episode where it's like, he gets his job back and he has a board in his room where the boss is like, you're going to be here forever. And he has pictures of Maggie on there. He's like, do it for her. Right. So that's emotional. That's all oh, sweet. You know, you're sacrificing for your daughter. But again, that's like I said, at the start of this, that's ticket to entry, brother. That is like, that's where you, that's, that is your divine responsibility. You know, and now the calling is to push that to the max because do you not love your kids? Do you not want the best for them? Okay, what does that mean really? No, but like really, like not just like you're gonna you're gonna do what you think success a safe route to success, but no, like it's it's getting the most out of life and um, you know pushing yourself like getting healthy, getting fit, showing a good example, right? And so yeah, it's definitely the heroes back then. It's like something more attainable, and now it's it's just the bar is lowered. It's Peter Griffin's and Homer Simpson's or like. Uh, like you said, otherworldly, you can't touch these other heroes and they deal with problems that you'll never have that aren't relatable, right? Um, 
but it's not yeah i definitely think you know like people point to batman a lot of oh he's human and and, and all this stuff so they they there's ways to find yeah. i think good and, messages and I, and I think you know christopher nolan's batman is a, is a very different it's a very yeah. different you know that that is a that's a work of art um yeah. <laughs> trilogy but it, and it speaks to much deeper themes as well um you know a lot of, <laughs> lot of what's going on right now uh and, look, and I, we're like I, two I, months you know, from bane coming out Gotham? <laughs> well yeah i mean we'll we'll see yeah, <laughs> we'll see. yeah. <laughs> that would be extraordinarily painful <laughs> um, oh man um and you know i've also heard to be fair that there's and i am not the movie guy sure so i i i but I hear there's some difference between like DC comics and the other one. And no. I don't, I don't know any of this. It's, stuff. No, no, no. It's all modern movie making. It's all like, it, it's not yeah. a problem of the stories, you know, cause you can find good stories on the other either side. It's just where the culture's at and the, the incentive behind making the movies, right. Um, the lack of reverence for the source material sometimes. And then, yeah, people like they, they'll it's, but it's the same thing. It's like an NPC comment. Oh, this is, you point out the flaws here. It's all theme parky. So I'm going to go to the dark and scary Snyder verse. It's like, what are yeah. you actually gaining from this? I, um, I, I think it's, I think there's too much, like, this is one of the things when I look at older movies, Yeah, they are, um, you know, part of it had to do with obviously the production value and what they could do back then. But you know, a lot of times, like, the effects are pathetic. I mean, you know, like, you can see, obviously, wooden swords that are, like, sure. painted. You know, yeah. it's, like, it's... And it can be very silly, the action scenes and not realistic kind of violence. But in in as compensation for that, there was profound emphasis on, on storytelling and, yeah. and yeah, that mythological aspect. Whereas I think, you know, today it's gone the opposite and it's just it, it's it's there isn't really storytelling anymore it's just yeah. dopamine you know you, you look at yeah. some of these things and you're like i don't even know what's going on it's just that people are getting you know it's like okay there's ostensibly some story here but nobody knows why the story is even important it's yeah. just like we're gonna go do this and then we're gonna smash 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 oh here's some funny line funny line you know blow. Well, yeah yeah and uh, it's like you're just putting in, you're sitting in your car seat, you put on the seat belt and you just two hours, like, you know, you're, you're entertained or whatever, but what are you actually gaining, gaining from it? Um, and you talked about heroes, you know, like back in the, there's a lot to say about like the cinematic change and everything and shift and how everything's, it needs to be a 10 part series to be green lit. And that's where the incentive is. It's not about making a story that will be a cult classic or resonate or actually tell something that's valuable. Um, and there's a lack of, you know, good heroes nowadays just because of where the culture's at in society and they don't want to see a strong masculine figure, you know, solving a problem because that's a threat, right? That's not what they're pushing. Um, so like you talk about heroes and stuff and I'm, I'm thinking like, uh, <laughs> um, uh, but just yeah, Mel Gibson and, and Braveheart, a patriot, you know, yeah, that, that yeah. type of stuff. And it's Mel like- obviously the exception. Yeah, like, <laughs> you know, they, they just don't make that stuff anymore, right? Um, or you got to find it in other in other means, other mediums, and not that cinema is the ultimate end all be all, and but for sure, like that's 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 part of it. Uh, well, it it's yeah. important because of how it informs, you know, the the culture. Like one one thing, for instance, and I and I admit, you know, I I enjoyed the series. It was very well done, except for like the last two seasons. But, ga but Game of Thrones, right? Mm. Game of Thrones, and everybody, you know, was taken taken on board by, by storm. It. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you know, you you had really it was very high production value, good actors, interesting characters. Yeah. But I think you know, but when you look at it, what is the underlying message of Game of Thrones? It's like it's extraordinarily nihilistic. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there's you know good, the good people are constantly killed evil people take over you know even to the extent that there is some sort of positive resolution it's like is it it's not really that positive it's like almost everybody dies it's it's very it it doesn't have any sort of transcendent quality to it in the end it's it's yeah almost, it's almost just like it it's very it's very low level whereas you contrast it with lord of the rings dude yeah i was gonna say yeah yeah and, lord, of the, uh, lord of the rings is a, is profoundly a piece about it, it is it is probably the book uh, and obviously the movie which was so well done is 
is filled with heroic archetypes throughout it and, and individuals who sort of have to face their demons. If they don't, then they, then they die. Yeah. But it's, everything is so, so, so symbolic. Yeah. And, and I think it's very much a series for the times. Right no, now. for sure. It's, it's timeless. Right. And so you get to those authors like Tolkien and then even C.S. Lewis, we recently rewatched uh, Narnia. Yeah. The yeah. First one. And C.S. Lewis, man, he had, he had the stones to put an allegory for the uh, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ yeah, in a children's yeah. book. It's wild. Yeah. Um, but uh, you get to that purity of good versus evil. And, and people think we're so sophisticated now. Oh, it's all morally gray. Everything's more like you have to have these other inputs. Like if it's just good and evil, it's just bland and baby. And it's like it's like that bell curve, you know. Mm -hmm. And it's like just good and evil. And then it's like no nuance and everything else. You need to have all the like specific whatever. And then it's like nuance or um, good and evil, right? Because that's ultimately where we're at. It's like there is a spiritual war going on. It is good. You know, there are re real like good versus evil. And it's like pick a side, brother. <laughs> like where, where are you? Where are you lining up? Um, but no, I, I think uh, just with storytelling, we can get a little a uh, little bit uh, – up our own, you know, we have to tell what's happening in, in the culture right now and not have transcendent values that will make this timeless, right? It's all like serving for the now issues. Um, and you talk about, you know, masculinity within the MCU. It's just like, what, what like Thor is one of my favorite heroes. And just what happened with his line alone in the MCU is is just abysmal. It's disgusting. And one of the best- it's kind of like fat, right? Fat. Well, well yeah, fat, but it's like uh, the last, it's just emasculated. You know, yeah. here's this like titan of like masculinity and like strength and like one of the heavy hitters. Like he's like the Superman of of, of the Avengers kind of, right? right. And so, uh, and then you just degrade him to this thing where he's like the butt of every joke and he's not- uh, and this latest movie, I was just really torn apart because I know the source material of like that villain. And, and um, it was one of my favorite comic book stories I've ever read. It's like Thor and, and God Bomb and Gore the God Butcher. There's just a lot of great stuff in there. But it was just totally, um, you know, hamstringed by like all the other agenda they're pushing. And and again, Thor is like not the hero. He he went from the, it's just it's just sad, you know. And so at that point, I was like, all right, this um checking out you know y'all can keep that i got other things to do anyway um and yeah it's just it's, it's sad where where that's where that's gone you know we, we can't tell those good stories anymore it's more so just blur well right everything everything has to at some point be hijacked and distorted and yeah it's, yeah it's you know if you ever have a good figure and and that's what tends to happen is they have some heroic figure and people unconsciously latch onto it yeah and then they distort it and they, and that, that's how, you know, that's the same reason they do all these remakes is that people have a nostalgic attachment to a yeah. version, a character. And so then they watch it, but this time, you know, he's trans. Next Top Gun, watch. Maverick's a chick. <laughs> yeah, ex ex exactly, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, Top Gun was refreshing. That was actually a good one I heard where it's like yeah. they, did it, they did it right. But. For, for a few minutes there, I really felt... Um, like rah rah America for like just like a few minutes. You know, Imagine getting back to that wow. Rocky Four energy. Couldn't yeah. happen. Twenty twenty three. Couldn't happen. <laughs> yeah. So um, so so we talk about all this stuff. And we talk about guys. So so what do you what do you see that men are really lacking with their mindset? Like talk about some of the yeah. stuff you work on them with. Yeah. Well, like I said, uh, and I'll tweet about this too. It's like you point to any problem in society, and I think it stems from a broken home. Right. And a broken home doesn't have to be just my view of it, where it's like uh, dad's not there. Right. Boo hoo. Uh, no, a broken home is two parents in the home that are just abusive or neglectful. Right. They don't again. Um, and I think a lot of there's a lot of I turned out fine out there. There's a lot of like things weren't that bad. Yeah, there was stuff, but it's fine. I turned out fine. You know, everyone thinks they turned out fine. Everyone thinks they're a good person. Bible tells you that too. Um, there's just misconceptions. And so uh, it's just, again, not wanting to actually go through the past and, and figure out how a better future. Right. And so with my program, again, it's, it's more so like the first, it's a three month thing. And the first month it's all focused on the past and how you got here, right. Mm -hmm. How you got to this point where, you're reaching out to someone like this, things aren't going well. And a lot of times it happened to me. It's like, you need a catalyst uh, to make any action, to give that urgency. Right. And for me, it was, uh, you know, letting my pain spill out onto others and, and do some things I'm not proud of. And then also like becoming a husband and father and, and being like, I need to do this now. Right. Um, so you have like an internal BS meter, 
where it's like, okay, you're ignoring your problems. Like, you know, you should be working out and you're not doing it. It keeps piling up, keeps piling up, whatever, whatever it is, right. You will let your, your problems that you're not addressing pile up until they get to eye level and then you can't avoid them. Mm -hmm. And at that point it's so high, it's going to topple over, hurt other people. That's the danger zone. You don't want to be there. Right. So, but unfortunately like to take action, a lot of people get there and a lot of people are picking up the pieces and recovering. Right. So uh, I definitely want to lead by example and encourage, inspire others to start thinking intentionally about this stuff beforehand, because that's ideal. You can work on it and, and, and just will help you overall. But I'm a big guy on the redemption arc. Uh, you know, I, I do think second chances are, are a big thing. And then, so what we do is when you get to this point where you're ready to take action, right? So we look at the past. The first month is just focused on the past. We go through the upbringing. We talk about all that and, and how that goes into the actions you're taking and not taking nowadays and how you view yourself, right? We look at all of the good qualities you have and everything that all your accomplishments that you're proud of. And then we look at all of your bad qualities and all of your failures and what led to each thing. Right. And so it's, it's a slash and burn policy, right? So if you're trying to rise like a Phoenix, right, you gotta, you gotta be on fire. Like, and this, this the ships are burning mentality. There's no going back. Mm -hmm. You have made this decision. We are here now and you will go forward with this. I talk, call it a bulletproof mindset because um, you know, again, you're going to have attacks. Your life's not going to be perfect. There's going to be adversity, but now you have the, the key to the tool to uh, withstand the storm and thrive, you yeah. know? Um, and so you can't get that ignoring your past. Uh, you really can't. There's like I said, and it, I, I know because I was there and it's mm -hmm. like, I I'm fine. I turned out fine. It's okay. I don't have to think about this. I don't have to think about how I got hit, as, how I got hit as a kid and how that affected me. Um, I'll just, you know, spank my kids a little bit. It won't be a problem, you know, um, whatever else. And, and we're just not think you know, a lot of people will say they want to be the best parent. It's like, what are you actually trying to do here? What, like, uh, what does that mean? What is that system for you? Um, and so, again, that's just a, one example, but that's what it is. The first month is like breaking down all of that, right? Mm -hmm. And so now we've burned the ships. We let go of that, that garbage that was holding you back, those self-limiting beliefs. And now we go all in, double down on what's good. And, and we say this is – it's all about, too, you know, with the mindset part of it, you're trying to achieve a goal, achieve success. You bring that to the forefront, right? So you're no longer trying to uh, stop drinking. You're no longer trying to be a better father. You're no longer trying to get in shape. It is you are this person now. This is your identity, and now you will act according with that, right? And so the second month is all about um, that identity and, and setting it up uh, to go forward, right? It's so you, you've taken the lessons. You've taken the good, and it's like where – because there's also an empty part, right? There's there's the there's the good you've had to this point, there's bad you've had to this point, and there's what you're missing, mm -hmm. right? And so we talk about like where are your priorities at in your life? Like not everyone can say I want to make a bunch of money, sit on a beach, retire, whatever, right? I want to. I tweeted this the other day. It's like everyone has I want to buy my mama house energy, but no one has I want to buy my mama house effort, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so it's like uh, where are your priorities? Do you really want to do something like that? Like no joke, not stop stop talking out your butt, like. Is this something that you really want to do? Um, so with that, it's like, you know, outlining the priorities and making sure that we're looking at the past and seeing like, okay, you've said this. And, and like for me, I said, I want to be a good dad forever. Why wasn't that happening before? Why wasn't I becoming the man I wanted to be before? Um, what was holding me back? That's part of the stuff you're letting go of. And so you get to this point, you outline your priorities and, and you set up your life to a point where you're not neglecting them because it's going to happen, you know, your day is going to be the day it is. And you need to make sure that as consistently as possible, you're not going to be perfect, but your actions more in line with your priorities than not. Mm -hmm. Right. And so everyone's like, Oh, I don't have time to do this. I don't have time to do that. It's a BS excuse. Um, you make time for what's important to you. You know, a uh, pretty girl calls your number. You got a hot date Friday. You're going to make time for it, you know? Um, and so you need to take that energy with it and like really uh, get into why am I not making time for what I say is important to me? Mm -hmm. Right. And this, I get a lot, you know, and you, you mentioned like being a father to your father or growing up as a man. And that's like, it, it, I was smiling because that's like a part where I'm at and I'm really like trying to pray about it and, and just meditate on how to reach this man and, and, you know, in a loving way and not, uh, so that, that's definitely part of it for me, but, but that's again, you know, what lesson you're taking and, and how you're giving it. So you talk about priorities and, and I, I mentioned that because my dad, I saw in him, he said something and did another thing, right? Yeah. He would say this is important to him, but he wouldn't show up, right? And so how serious do you take that? Are you a man of your word? That is huge, 
You know, it's easy to say I'm a man of my words. It's harder to do it, right? Do you do what you say you will do? And that was like on a bracelet in sophomore year of high school for me for our football team, right? And so it's like these lessons kind of transcend that that time. But again, it's it's true. Like as a man, you got to be a man of your word, right? It's a couple of things like as a man, you would think like you got to provide, you got to protect and, you know, have honor, right? Integrity, man of your word, right? But it's, and there, there's more depth to that though, because um, there, you know, I'm not perfect at, I'm not going to sit here and say all the time, but when I look you in the eyes and I say, I'm going to do something, you know, there's integrity in it and, and it, will, it will get done, you right. know, but it's easy when there's social pressure, when there's peer pressure, when your name is on the line, but what about internally? What about when you're setting a goal for yourself? Why is there not that same level of urgency? I had no problem waking up at 5 a.m. for morning workouts at football. I had no problem waking up early for work, right? But for some reason, when I say I'm going to do it for myself, I, I hit snooze because I don't have to. Why, right. do you not, why do you not have to? You know, Why are you not important enough? Why is what you say you want to do not important enough for you to actually do it? right? So we, we kind of break that down in that second month and, and strategize of, of you know your priorities and and why and, and how to how to get there yep. and the, the, go ahead sorry i was gonna say and i think i think so much of that with like guys you know saying that they're gonna do something and they're not doing it i mean i can say that i was very guilty of this and you know and the reason is because in part i would just say yes to stuff that i didn't really want to do yeah. or have any kind of intention of doing a big I, part just of it would, too. I would just say it just because it's like, yeah, I'll do it, you know, but who really cares? I don't really care. So, and, and I think this is especially an important thing when it comes to relationships, because like women, you know, like if they ask you to do something and you're like, yeah, I'll do it. And like, it's like super low on your priority list. They, they really, that means a lot to, to a woman. And when you don't do it, it's like, it's, it's a devastating thing for them. And so, yeah. I, I had to become very mindful of that. Like if I say I'm going to do something like I'm going to do it, but the corollary to it is that I'm not just going to say I'm going to do everything. You can't give that weight. Cause if that really carries weight, you can't give that word to everything. You can't. Yeah. She says like, Oh, can you, you know, can you take this someplace? I'm like, no, I can't today. I can do it next week. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Good. No, and, and that's part of the relationship too is like so huge. Like they're they want that reassurance, that comfort I'm being taken care of. Right. Yeah. Or at least in, in a relationship, you know, some random chick, you don't gotta you're not obliged to give your word to every last that asks it, right? No, no, I mean and, and that's part of boundaries. And and so this is one of these things, it's like poor boundaries is saying yes to everything and doing nothing. Like yeah. I, I've I've had individuals who've wanted to work with me who will sit, talk about how much, you know, they want to work. They're really excited. And I'm like, this guy's going to flake completely. Like I, I, Call I, your I shot. yeah. I, and I'm, and I'm right. Like 90% of the time, because and in that 10% that they do do it, it's still like a hassle because you gotta mm -hmm. like, because you, you can tell that they want the validation of me. Like endorsing that. Yeah. They want, they, they want the, yeah like yeah i'm gonna the, do the it. mental like, squirts of like oh he likes me now because i'm gonna do his thing yeah it's like look i don't like i know i know that because you're you're like i'm gonna be the best client ever i'm like no you're not yeah yeah percent not the guys are the best clients are the guys who are really humble and just you know they don't talk <laughs> themselves up at all they just say yeah you know that, I, I got this problem and i want to solve it that's what's interesting about men learning anything, you know, we're, we're prideful, arrogant bunch. And so it's like, if you're really going to change, or you're really going to take something to account. I think it has to come from a place of humility. It yeah. has to acknowledge that something's wrong and that you, you need help. Right. And a lot of times pride and haughtiness will keep it. There, I think there's two sides of people not helping themselves. One of it is like super arrogant and like, I don't need help really. Uh, maybe they say they will, but they don't really believe it. And they'll be like, I'm fine. But then there's also the, the doormat niceness mentality, right. Where they're not, they don't, value themselves enough to do what's necessary if that mm -hmm. makes sense yeah. um yeah and so that that's that's pretty much the 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 second thing and then the third month just really quick is yeah just implementation right mm -hmm. of everything and making sure for this month we we do what we say we're going to do we're, we're tangible and tangibly improving so by the end of this three months you already have something that to hold on to look i've improved this much with this thing and you can take that forward and so the goal of it is to really give you that thing where it's like, and you have resources available to where you can call back on it later in life when there's storms, you know, cause that's what the bulletproof mindset is. Like you're going to take damage, but you're going to survive and you're going to thrive.
right? Yeah. Um, and you talked about earlier that I'd love to get to this point of uh, young men and purpose because that's huge. And I think purpose is like a huge, uh, just o- not overstated, but it's like the grand jewel. You know, everyone wants to live a purposeful life. They want to be fulfilled and, and content. And, and it's not happiness, right? That's an illusion. That's the instant gratification demon drug that society tries to sell you. Um, it's it's fulfillment, contentment, right? And it's it's genuine um, peace, right? Uh, and purpose. But so young guys come, I, like I remember when I was 17 or 18 in high school and they're like giving you the SATs or whatever. They're like, oh, what are you going to, what's going to be your major? I hated that question going to college. Like I just hated it. It's like, why are you making me choose lock in my whole life right now when I don't know anything. I don't, you know, I felt so unguided. Um, and again, I just full straight up, you know, I just like who I am now and who I was then is this very different. And a lot of it was like confidence and, and just cowardice and fear and no, lack of, you know, I can't whatever. Right. Mm-hmm. Football helped me a lot. And I, I've definitely grown, but the point is like, I've been in those shoes. I know what it's like to, to be, uh, like, what is my, what is my real purpose? What do I, like, I don't want to waste time or anything. And I don't like, it's fear of failure. Again, it's fear of trying and, and failing, which ultimately experience is what, you, where you're going to get that from, mm-hmm. you know, it's putting yourself out there and following your instincts. And I think, you know, being humble and commuting with God and, and, and opening yourself up to that relationship and showing his path for you, uh, will, will bear fruit. Right. And so, I think young men get too caught up and I need to have everything figured out. And when really, you know, you talk about the fundamentals, you talk about ticket to entry stuff, like you're failing in a lot of areas, you know, you're, you're addicted to porn. You're, you're watching video games or movies like all day and all your free time, right? You're not striving for anything. You're not trying to do anything. You're not talking. It's the last time you talk to a girl. There's just plenty of things to point out in like the incel or, or whatever, right? Uh, there's a bunch of neckbirds arguing online about BS that has no relevance to them. Meanwhile, they're just not, doing anything in their personal lives, you know, like you don't like, you're all worried about Ukraine or whatever else political and you're, you're getting all hyped up about a political leader or whatever, but what's the man in the mirror doing? What's he saying? You know, that's like, you want to have change, not just in your life, but societally, because a lot of it is black pill and you feel powerless and I can't do anything anyway. So what's the point? And it's like, no, you can do something. There is, there is a path. There is hope. You just got to get off your ass. You got to look at the man in the mirror, lead yourself, and then you can lead your family and lead your community, you know? Um, and so as far as purpose, you need, you need your baselines, right? For young guys, if I could tell this message at all, it's like, you need your baselines. Like you need uh, your physical fitness, get that in order. Health is just jet, like, Generational wealth, sure, financials, but but health, giving your family longevity, mobility, and health into the long years, that is like super high return on investment. Right. Mm-hmm. And that's for me too. It's like I see a lot of health problems in my in my family's life, a lot of obesity and other things like that. And so I want my kids to not grow up like I did. I was like a fat kid that became an old lineman and it helped. And football encouraged me overeating and being the biggest sure. guy, yeah. I, you know. So I leaned into that and it helped, sure, on the field, but it's like now I'm a dad. I don't need to be 330 pounds, you know, <laughs> it got, it got up there, bro. It, before I started yeah, taking yeah. action. Um, but so, yeah, I lost uh, 50 pounds since I started uh, going through this thing. And it's been, cause I'm always just a little tangent on that. Like I'm always uh, I'm a hard worker. I can work six hour, uh, six days a week, two a days, you know, whatever it is, I'm used to that. But really what helped me uh, really take this seriously and, and align with my intention, like we talked about earlier, my intent is to lead by example with my family, show them a healthy lifestyle, right? I can show them how to work hard, but that's not going to help eating the right things and and knowing you don't have to overeat and stuff like that, right? So it took me humbling myself, learning something new, um, again, from people on Twitter and everything like that, and uh, changing, real real life change, not just a fad diet where you lose 20, 20 pounds and you go back uh, the next month, right? Because you haven't really changed. It's like, no, fundamental change comes from the root up and it comes from humility and it comes from again getting those intentions in line and priorities so so that's yeah i, I just think like young guys don't need to focus on the grand picture i need to have my zen my my kusfaba whatever like no just get your health right like i think fine you know uh body mind and spirit right well yeah and i think you know especially talking about the zen stuff I mean, as a young man, you shouldn't be trying to find your Zen. You you shouldn't be trying to find peace. You should be trying to find war. I was you should be going to war. You should yeah. be <laughs> I mean, yourself. <laughs> that that's the the feminine seeks out peace. Yeah. The masculine thrives on war. And and I don't mean this in like the sense of like killing people. 
I mean this in the sense of being on the edge, yeah. being on the frontier. I mean, that that is war is such a is a place where heroes are more are made. Yeah. Because it's a place where death is present. You know, or, or failure is present, right? Where yeah, it's like well, I mean, real all, failure, all failure is is death. It's just a yeah. it's just a mini death. And and the guys are too are too afraid to to do that. They're always looking. They're like, how do I, you know, how do I, you know, feel better about myself? Go go actually do something, like literally go fucking do something. Yeah, and you're help someone better. else, make someone else feel better, then talk to me. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, look, I'm all about the internal growth and all the, all the, you know, checking your, you know, doing the deep work, like 100%. It's part of the work I do with clients, but y- you can't really have interchange unless there's outer action. Yeah. And, you know, you, you've got to, you've got to put yourself out there. And then, and, and, you know, when it comes to, to dating, let's just say, I mean, I, I'm a dating and relationship coach, but it's really just that I use women as a vector for guys to meet their edge. You know, a guy Mm -hmm. wants, wants to do better with women. Well, I mean, really what this is about is the fact that he's afraid of, of an edge that women present. And so it's about gaining him there. And if he does this, then he's going to grow and expand as a man. And that's where's my purpose. Well, guess what? You know, early on, you might not necessarily know your purpose, and the only way that you find it out, like you have too, if you have too much bullshit going on with yourself, you have too much negative self-talk. You're never going to be able to, to hear that voice. It's yeah. Get scared by all the negativity. So what you have to do first is just simply go off on, onto the edge, do something that's scary for you. And the more of that stuff that you do, then you, you gain more confidence in yourself and you start to realize, wait a minute, I actually have the traits to be able to succeed in this, in this realm. Wait, yeah. this, these are some gifts that I have. And then opportunities start to present themselves and you start gradually, the more you come to internal stillness, the more your, your purpose becomes clear. Yeah. But I mean, it's like, how do I, how do I, you know, stop being so afraid? It's like, what, what, what kind of, I, I'm not ready to go out there yet, but I want to do some more deep work. It's like, no, that's an entirely other problem. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that the the I mean, I don't want to just steal everyone's stuff, but Ajax was like it's mental masturbation, right? Where it's like you're just you're you're amping up and you're you're trying to find all the variables. You're never going to have a perfect outcome. It's not perfect information, right? You're never going to have that, and you can't plan it all because once you enact it, right, a plan never survives like a more than a minute with an enemy, right? That was said somewhere, and it's like so. The point is like. Uh, you can spend all this time trying to prep and everything. And, Oh, I need to do all this before I talk to a girl. I need to do all this before I get married. Right. And, uh, that was, that was my thing is like, that was holding me back from marriage is like, I needed to graduate. I needed to have a house, a career and something to offer her. Right. Um, because I was taking for granted the love that was there that was established for so long. Right. And so it was really just my fear of mm-hmm. not being worthy. And so that's, again, it stems back to fear of, of, uh, trial and error and going out there and, and, getting the experience you need. <clears throat> but so, yeah, it's, you don't plan, you, you act, right? And so having the courage to do that comes from your your self-worth and, and being willing to go to war, like you said, with, with yourself, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's... It, it, I, I wish more guys would, uh, you know, when they're worried about the risk, they'd say what, you know, they'd, they'd actually... Because all, all this talk about, like, it's too risky to get married. It's too risky to do this. It's too oh, risky man. to get my hand off my cock right now. Yeah, yeah. Like, get fucking real here for a second. Is it too risky being as pathetic as you are right now? Is is it is there any risk, perhaps, in being a total fucking waste of life? Like yep. you've been doing, afraid to do everything? Like, there's no proper risk assessment. Life is not this, like, if you, everything's all safe and perfect if you don't move. No, life is like, you know, those video games where you you have to jump on a cube and the cube like if you're on, if you're on that floating square too long it disappears and you fall down. Yeah, there's that angst. It's like, <laughs> oh, like yeah. Like like you need to have that proper balance of you jump on the next step and then you look what's the next direction then you jump on the next one, but you have to be constantly jumping. Yeah. If you're not constantly jumping, then you're going to fall into the pit. Like yeah. 
that's a comfort. Lot of, yeah, a lot of guys, it's like they're they're so worried about making the next move. Well, what if it doesn't work? Well, what if you do the same thing that you're doing right now and you, yeah. you're guaranteed to fail and you deserve to fail? Yeah. And, and I don't yeah. have any sympathy for you. I mean, I, I've just, as time's gone on and I've really interacted more with real men, I I have so little tolerance for for the guys who, you know, and, and I, I think at this point, there's there if anybody is willing to 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 do it to to do the work if anybody is willing to step out there but i don't want anything to do with guys who lack the most basic masculine instinct of being inspired by heroic action yeah if if, if a man cannot be inspired by heroic action then he's not a, a man as far as i'm concerned he's a worm yeah, yeah. And, and there's too many of these guys out there right now it's Again, you know, I point that's a problem, you know, stems from from broken homes, from broken men that aren't instilling these values, right? And so you get this this these men that have no direction. But it's again the purpose of like you need to figure it out, <laughs> like like period, you know. Um that there's no excuse nowadays because of the digital age we live in, the information's out there, right? And the the time, I don't have enough time, I don't have like that's that's a BS excuse too. There's really it's just excuse after excuse to to convince yourself that you are destined to be in this bad spot forever. And so I'm going to stay here. I'm never going to take action against it. Right. It's that's, that's what it is. And so I, I loved the football environment. And I love the energy you're bringing to it right now, because it brings this visceral feeling of like, like you want to sh check them. You want to shake them like, like, Hey dude, like get, get it together. And with, with football too, like I said, it's, it's that, that realm. That's why I love like team sports specifically. It's like each rep is like six seconds. Right. And you have six seconds to, get it right or get it wrong and someone gets hurt, you know? Um, and that's so correlated to life. Um, and that's, I like team sports because it gives you those, these life examples in a controlled environment and, and, and a quick, and again, confidence in these scenarios comes from repetition, comes from reps. Right. And so if you find someone that's afraid to do the work or too lazy to do the work, you can't help them. They're not going to start. And that's just, that gets to another part of this conversation where I've been, I've been thinking about for a while. It's like the world needs brick layers. There's going to be a, a uh, major part of society that just doesn't click, you know, yeah. and that, that, you know, God bless them. They'll, they'll, they'll do good work and honest work, uh, ideally, you know, and there's also the degenerate side of it that actively detract from society and make things harmful and make, you know, people want to move away from a city because of this energy that's there, right. This culture that's there, that's not, um, trusting and not, uh, you know, you talk about a high trust society. It comes from people that are, that are motivated and know, uh, try to do their best and hold themselves morally accountable. Mm -hmm. to a higher power, right? Um, that's the true, free, high-trusting society. That's what the Founding Fathers envisioned, you know, uh, having a bunch of free people and uh, people that are intentional with it and and know how to take risks. And But again, you know, keep themselves morally accountable. That's a huge piece that's, that's like lost. You can't have that without that that piece, you know? Um, but yeah, I, that's, that's where I'm at with it. Yeah, I think a lot of, you know, I do think that there's, I, I've, as time's gone on, I've, I've leaned much more on the nature versus versus nurture side. I mean, I, th yeah. I, I, I think a lot of, I think, you know, people are products of their environment in the sense that they can be deceived and they can be degraded and essentially they can have an inner light in them obscured. Yeah. And they, you know, they don't know how to trust it. Like, and so I, to that extent, of course, I, I, I mean, you'd have to be a fool to say that environment doesn't have any kind of impact at all. But, you know, otherwise, you know, the fundamental characteristics of humanity haven't changed yet. Society is degenerated. So, you know, you can tell right there that social engineering is real. But there is a certain light in some people versus other people. Mm -hmm. And I think this has always been true. It's always been noticed. And I don't really care where a guy's at. A guy could be totally, you know, broken down. A lot of his life isn't put together. But if he feels like there's something more for him, if he feels like there's more that 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 he has a he has a, a purpose, even if he doesn't know what the purpose is, just simply knowing he has that purpose. Yeah. That is a man that has the potential for greatness in him. And, 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 and they know it and they tell you today not to think that about yourself, not that if you hear that as a really good, um, really good thread by this account 
it's called like chivalry something. I don't know what it is. Yeah, chivalry guild or something. Yeah, chivalry guild. Yeah, and they they had this threat on Aragorn from Lord of the Rings. Yeah, his yeah. Hand was not an unwilling king, and I and it it was it just cut to the point of something so important that you know I had never heard somebody reconcile it. It was always like didn't the whole like well, is there there's good pride and there's bad pride. You know, there's like where does this. And he really got to the core of it, which is this idea of, you know, use magnanimity, which is that there is a sense that you know that you are meant to be great, that you have great things to do, great things to accomplish. Yeah. And but but there's a humility with it that you understand it's from a position of service, but it doesn't mean that you still don't see that greatness within you. I I, I look for guys who have that just that Spark. little yeah, a little spark within them. I, yeah. I don't, I don't think in my life, I, I think, you know, you can tell which people where they're, who have that spark and which people, you know, which, which people don't. I mean, I've met people in my life and I can assure you they don't have a spark. It's not there. Yeah. Where it was it's, so faint that it, it never stood a chance. Yeah. It gets stamped out because, because yeah. the odds are against you. They really are, and they'll, they'll crush that light with the, the way things are going on if you don't have a good, you know, some good guidance going on. So, yeah, that's that's an interesting perspective with it. I think it definitely, like, the, the spark can be watered and, and nurtured absolutely, and that's why I think with these people that you can lead them to water but not make them drink, the best thing to do, I, I think, you know, not – lead by example and inspire right like occasionally yeah throw some encouragement their way because a lot of these people you know didn't didn't really hear it right it took there was a time in my high school time when i was like i thought i was i was okay at a lot of things but i wasn't great at anything yeah you know i was just very very mediocre and i couldn't find what i was really good at and it, it was just me you know not uh, recognizing the value I bring. And so my online coach told me, like, you're pretty good at football. Like, you like, you know, at least there's the like that. And even that little thing, and it just sparks that, like, no, you can practice and put effort into something and become great, mm. you know? Um, and so that's the other part of it where it's like people, exp like, it's not going to come from nothing. You're not just going to have it. The skills are built and, and practiced and you can, and, and they can be forged. Right. Mm -hmm. It just, it has to have from that spark of like, I know I'm meant for something greater and just how do I get there? Right. Uh, and again, a lot of that uh, can be brought up uh, in, in the right uh, fatherly embrace, right. With the right, again, and once you have that, like you talk about how to inspire the best, that's where it goes to is, is you know, becoming the best man for, for yourself. And then becoming that father. Like if I can give anything to my kids, it is that, that you're describing that yeah. spark, right? That no matter what happens, you will find a way you will find success. You know, that if anything else, that is, that is a, a goal is to give them that, you know? Uh -huh. um, yeah. It's, it's hard to work with and, uh, and reach out to the people that, that don't have it, that are just the pessimists. But, but I don't, I don't see the logic there because it's like, what, what do you, what would you rather your kids have? Would you rather your kids have that energy and that, that pessimistic, like, you know, I don't think a lot of these people want anything, you know, I, you I know. think that there's a lot of, there's a lot of self contempt and self hate and they thrive off being in a negative environment. You know, I think with the black pill stuff in particular, it's like, you know, this is what's going to, everything's going down to shit, you know, nothing's going to change. It's like, it's like, even if that were true, yeah. I mean, it, it, do you just want to be the guy who let it happen? You know, you know what I mean? Like, what's the point of living in it? Yeah. That's, that's the way I look at it. It's like, you know, it, there, I just don't like in, in any kind of military unit, historically, if someone's sort of talking like that, they'd shoot them. Yeah. Cause that's a liability <laughs> right there. That person's yeah. gonna get you like that, dude. I and even like watching <laughs> Saving Private Ryan as a kid, that one dude that sat there with the bullets as the dude that just killed his friends walked yeah. by. I've never viscerally wanted to go and like physically assault a person before <laughs> on a screen, but that was it as a kid. I recognized it like such coward, it was just revolting, like you said, you know, um, that you, you're bind bound to an action and it's ugh, yeah. a, a liability, yeah. And but the good news is that I don't. You know, as long as you make fun of those people, like, I don't think that they really, they don't really matter. And the reason I yeah. say that is because every single, like, these, these kind of people have always been with us. 
They've always been with us. They always will be with us. Um, well, maybe not if we really actually ascend, <laughs> but but it's it's been the way of humanity. And, you know, the, the American Revolution, I mean, estimates vary between, you know, one and three percent of the population was like an actively actively participated in that. I mean, oh, wow. it's it's an extraordinarily low number of people can change the course of history when they when they say enough is enough enough is enough yeah. and it it it's a very much a local thing you know i'm not advocating for anyone to do anything crazy but it's just simply a matter of like being engaged in your community and say enough of the bullshit that's going on here there's bullshit going on here you know what i mean yeah. it's really it's that simple it's that simple oh it's going to be an inconvenience yeah you know yeah maybe, kills, maybe running for the school board is going to entail a couple of you know extra nights like i think Men need to understand that their life is supposed to be about work. Yeah. You're, you're supposed to be working and not doing like drudgery, not just trying to get by. I mean, you are supposed to be laboring and putting yourself out there and and pushing your limits. And, you yeah. know, take a rest here and there. No one's having any issue with that. Men, you know, I think the nature of men is strenuous effort followed by periods of complete relaxation. Yeah. Um, like a kind of constant busy that yeah, it, yeah. It's effective actions. It's actions that bear fruit. It's actions yeah. that serve your purpose and you can see the results, right? So if I'm working my butt off, but I see my family's like happy and thriving and they love me, you know, uh, or just whatever else it is, it's like that makes, makes it all worth it. Right. And I'm not here to show like a thing. Like, I think it's actually bad because people will just focus on providing right and they'll they'll work themselves to the bone and think that's noble noble sacrifice um and but again like we talked about earlier that's ticket to entry right we are called to do more we're called to um build up more of a relationship uh than just the the providing uh, yeah and and i even i'd even add the distinction that you know ticket to entry i think is a good way to put it but guys will think like well you know i i made money for my family that means i was you know like i did what i was supposed to do it's like you should be doing this because you want to do it. It's not yeah. some kind of obligation. It's like yeah. you you want to make money for your family. It's like, well, well, you know, men have all the all this burden. They want to do all this stuff. Like, I'm not saying that you wife up some nag who doesn't appreciate anything you do. Okay, this is yeah. like totally don't you know gaslight. But as a man, like, oh, I got to do more work than her. It's like, what what are you a feminist? Like you you want. <laughs> You want the woman, I want a feminine woman, um, but you know, women have to contribute their fair share to it. It's like, what, listen to yourself for a second. What yeah. the fuck do you actually want? Because you're, yeah. you're saying on one hand, you don't want to have to do work, but then you want a feminine woman. Well, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. Hard men get soft women. <laughs> <laughs> soft men yeah. get hard women. And then everyone's like, why, you no, know, why is she bossing me around? It's like, Cause you're soft. Yeah. You allow it to happen, right? And that's that's where the accountability part comes into play. It's like all everything in your life up to this point, and it's a hard realization to make. It is. It's it can be can be crumbling for some because of whatever their past is. But it's like every you are who you choose to be. I was like one of my favorite movies is Kid Iron Giant. It's like you are who you choose to be, right? And so um that part is like so true. It's like you guys just gotta take accountability. And it's it's hard because yeah, everything's your fault. But at this point, you can move forward in control of your life. You're not yielding that control to someone else sure. or to some boogeyman or whatever else you want, you know, racism, whatever, whatever you're gonna make up for in your life, whatever victimhood mentality you're gonna put in yourself. No, now it is the onus is on you and you can move forward and have agency and have action and take action. You know you're worth more, you're gonna get more, right? Um, and you really hit something huge for me, like, cause right now in the place that I'm at, just seeing, you know, God working through my life and the success that I'm seeing. Uh, I used to think, um, cause like I said, I've always been a hard worker and I've come up, you know, I've always, I've, from a struggle where it's like, you know, money's been tight. And so I always thought the goal was to like, uh, make, be comfortable and be able to, like I said, I always want to be a dad. So I always want to be around them, but to just like chill all day. Like I'm a huge nerd. I love video games and stuff like that. So I was like, I'll just chill most of the time, board games, whatever. I mean, now I'm so enthralled with that purpose, with that spark, with, with what I'm doing, I'm building multiple businesses. I'm, I'm, you know, on fire for my family. I'm getting my health in order. My, my marriage is, is great. And, you know, we're talking about kids and the future and I'm connected to a local church. I've never been closer to God before in my life. I have a reverence for prayer, a real reverence, you know, it's not just words, 
Um, I have, again, it's part of networking. It's part of seeing other men and being inspired by their example and not the examples that I had growing up. Um, but now I have a network of faithful men to call upon for support and to go to as a resource. That is, that is immense. And like I said, I think a lot of this, that spark, that, that stem, it will come from, you still need to be able to put your back against the wall, having nothing and be confident and, and just win, you know, because there's no other option. Right. Uh, but after that, I like, absolutely get that support system going. So like I said, I just, with, with where I'm at in my life, like I've been putting in the work, I've uh, been grinding about this stuff. It's been tough. It's been a struggle, but I'm just now like seeing some floodgates open, uh, seeing different opportunities pour into my life. And this is after, you know, having that reverence for prayer, praying on it, being connected, uh, being, uh, you know, have, letting him kind of guide my path as well. Right. Uh, that was like a key piece to me missing for so long. I, I, I grew up, Roman Catholic, but I, it was just tradition. I didn't have anything uh, that was my own with it. You know, um, I had, I had a faith, but it was more so we do this because it's Sunday sure. we go. Right. Um, and so getting that uh, and then going to all the stuff I went through with my dad and then going to college and trying to be a man, you know, uh, from a boy to a man, I was, there's just a story here of where like I went from, I grew up in Southern California. So it was like hot, nice weather or whatever. And then I go to on top of a mountain in Colorado, like one of the top five coldest states or cities in America. Um, and I'm alone. I'm by myself. Right. And it's just forged by fire. Make, um, make some friends. And I had football, but it was just a really tough time. It was cold. I was away from my girlfriend of like four years. Um, no family there. And that was this moment. I was away from the church for a while because whatever happened in high school um, kind of drifted off. Uh, I think that's kind of where the culture pushes you anyway, you know, in general, when you're kind of just involved in it. But uh, I was at this point where it was like a spring game and it's like family day and all my buddies have their families there and I just got nothing. Right. And I'm fighting for a starting spot and uh, things are tough. And I'm thinking in my head, man, uh, this is tough. This is really like, you know, I'm, I'm over my head here. I'm just, I, and I'm still that, in, that confidence of like, I'm a new player on this team. I'm a freshman and, and, you know, there's all these college guys. I'm not a man yet. You know, that, that whole thing, you go from such confidence as a senior in high school to like nothing again, which is pretty funny. Um, and, and I just had this moment during stretches where I'm like, this is hard. Maybe this is, I need help. Maybe this is how I come back to God. And then as right before the, the game started, I remember in my head, I said, no, fuck that. Do the work, you know? Like just somehow in some vain attempt of a boy trying to become a man, I I told myself, just do it. Right. And so that like and, you know, the game went however it went. And I ended up spending like another another year there. Uh, <clears throat> it definitely didn't turn out that way. You know, God has a funny way of, of you make plans and God will laugh. So like after the next season, I end up moving back to California. I leave that school. Right. And I go to a junior college for a year and then I have opportunities to go across the nation to different schools. And I choose to go to this one school in Southern California that is a Christian school, Mm -hmm. you know, Um, after all that, after that rebuke and that, you know, time in my life. And I think like, oh, this is how I'm going to come back to God. This is going to be fine. And then I I have a good time, make some relationships. And then they close down the football program at that school. And so I'm like, what? Like, (laughs) I'm just pulling the legs from under me. It's like, what is going on? Like, what is the path? Where am I supposed to go? Um, and I, you know, and then also going through some troubles with my, my relationship and where it's just, you know, we were at a point we've been together eight years and it's like, are we going to move forward or are we going to break apart? Like, what are we doing here? You know, I'm not proposing, we're not doing that yet. And so just all this turmoil in my life. And I decided instead of like going off to another place right away, I, I stepped back and, uh, for, for six months, it was like 2021, um, my uncle was like really in, in critical condition and, and not just doing rough. Right. And this guy's like been the most of a father figure to me as I could have. Uh-huh. And this whole time in my college career, I've been like living my own life, like not really thinking about family. Um, and I always thought like, I need to be successful at this because of family. Everyone sacrificed so much to get me here. So I need to make this football thing work. I need to get a degree. Right. And so I'm at this point where I can go getting recruited to other places and I'm still like upset with God. Like, how can this be your plan? Whatever. And then uh, it's just a moment of an opportunity for humility, right? Because I could have been vain and chased the football dream and everything. But I saw like my family at on Christmas, we were talking about like, you know, things are rough. Like we don't have people to take care of him. This is like so hard. And so I, you know, I saw an opportunity where I could stay, hey, let me move in. I'll live in the living room and I'll care for him. You know, I'll do this stuff. I'm an able man. Let me like, I, you know, Um, and 
uh, instead of my football stuff. Right. And so I did that and it really was, you know, God working through me in that turmoil and putting me through all these trials and, and humbling me. Right. Uh, and, and putting me, giving me this opportunity to, to come back to him, because like I said, I was able to work through, it was just, that home had a lot of influence there, spiritual influence. And so I, I just was, was doing, I was serving others. I was putting myself last. I was working hard. I was still trying to get a degree. I was trying to keep up my football strength so I can go somewhere else. Um, all these things going on in my life. And like we've been together eight years and we're having this term, all these arguments, we're not sure what we're going to have. It's unstable, right? I love this girl. I want my life with her, but I'm, you know, things aren't working out. And so I end up like, I just, it was a stressful night and I just, go to a beach one day and I'm just sitting there and I'm just like, what do I do? You know, like I had that moment and, uh, and I, I realized I did not make my intentions with, with my wife clear. I did not offer a ring ever. You know, I never like said like, Hey, let's get married and stuff. And so, so yeah, she says, she says yes. And we end up, you know, it, it was just a pivotal time in my life where I, it, he shakes your world, you know, and so it comes to that hum humble moment where you, you just put yourself last and like, show me the way. And, and he, he speaks through you. And so we, we got married, we, we moved to Illinois, uh, got um, baby and everything. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just, like I said, uh, as far as where I'm at and this purpose in my life and not wanting to just go to contentment, you know, but now I'm in a place where after everything I've been through, I see the plan. I see the vision. I see like, it's not my dream goal. Isn't to be sitting on a beach when I'm 60 or whatever. I know I'm always going to be inspiring other people. I'm always going to be talking. I want to mentor the next young guy. I want to help whoever I can and give them what I didn't have growing up. And also, you know, just, just for the kingdom, push his kingdom forward and, and talk about the gospel and everything. Cause that again, talk about that fathers, but everyone needs Christ. And I think that comes from a shepherd of the home. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, that's that's where it is. It's no longer like let me chill on on what I have and what I've built, and I'll just relax, entertain myself now. Like no, I'm, I know I'm always going to be busy, but I'm I'm very content with that. You know, yeah, it's funny. It's funny how um, God calls you home. I mean, for you, it was taking away the the thing that you love most, which was football. Right? Yeah, yeah. For me, it was the a woman who I really really loved. Yeah, um, and I had to come back to get her. <laughs> wild kind of kind of story but but yeah and then but the thing is like once you dedicate yourself um i think guys should understand two things about it predominantly first if you are really give you know people talk about sell your soul to the devil hmm. and you know so you get all this stuff but then he owns you well, it's the same way with god like you give your you yeah give, you give your soul to god and like be prepared to like you're 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 going to feel at peace and you're going to feel protected, but don't do not think for a second that you've got easy work ahead of you, that you're not no. going to go through experiences. It's, it's the opposite. It's like, okay, yeah. you, you want this, like, you know, you, you accepted that you're going to, that like, I get to use you for my purpose. And, you know, you are going to be put through things and you're going to lose things that you thought you wanted yeah. Um, and as time goes on, it makes more and more sense and you understand why, but, um, it's, uh, it's, it's definitely a ride. Well, well, Tim, I really appreciate having you on. Um, For sure, man. obviously you're on Twitter yeah. and, um, and you do, it sounds like a three month coaching program from what you were describing earlier. Yeah. 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 Okay. Is there anything else that you want to tell the audience about? Uh, well, sure. Just, uh, like I, I have a link I'll give you, I'm sure it'll be in the description, but it has all of my work, uh, you know, that my, where you can find me on socials. Um, I am also like a founder of Salon Boss. It's a company I built with my brother. It's a marketing company. And like I said, that work, we put in like six months of work. Money's been really, really tight. And then we come through and it's like floodgates, right? So we're getting huge opportunities now. So that's in there as well um, as, as, yeah. And so there's, newsletter, Twitter, follow me. Um, I, this is, this is what I talk about. You know, if you, if you, this resonates with you at all, I'd love to connect and, and talk about it more. Um, that, that's really it, Pat. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to come on here. I love the discussion, man. We got into a lot. There's yeah. like way more to get into with, with different sex of it, but I'm glad we got to like some nerd stuff. Cause that's, I like that too. And, um, no, I just appreciate it, brother. I think it was, I think it was good. Well, thanks so much, bro. I, I enjoyed it as well. Take care guys. And I'll see you next time. See you.